Hey folks, this is Kalani. One of the most exciting parts of a new expansion is the fact that pretty much everything resets. Everything is new, including the dungeons. Remember how exciting it was when you finally unlocked the Arcway and Court of Stars? Or when Karazhan, the Cathedral of Eternal Night, and the Seat of the Triumvirate were added into the game? It's another little pocket of awesome new stuff that we get to learn and really sink our teeth into. Battle for Azeroth is launching with 10 dungeons, just as many as the start of Legion, so I'm really looking forward to exploring these new caverns, tombs and temples, and working my way up through the ranks of Mythic Plus. I was blown away by some of the dungeons in Legion, but I think from what I've seen so far, the dungeons in Battle for Azeroth will definitely take the cake. Let's have a look at what kinds of environments we'll see, the general story of why we're heading into these dungeons, and some overall thoughts for each one. The Troll Temple of Ataldazar will take you on a Gold Rush roller coaster to chase down some traitors from the Horde storyline. It might seem a bit weird for Alliance players hopping in here, but there's plenty of loot to plunder, so don't worry too much about the details. Lots of trolls, lots of troll statues, and even more dinosaurs. You'll have to fight off princesses who try to cover you in molten gold and sap the strength from your entire party, and a huge zombie troll with lots of totems which constantly heal him up. He gets pretty mad if you take those totems away from him too. There's an undead dinosaur in a pit of bones down below who may or may not have been a god in a past life, either way he's going to try and eat you, and then the last boss is a crazy spider lady who's guarding the entrance to the Troll King tombs, which we'll also be plundering later on. Ataldazar is a wonderful open-air dungeon which gives you the option to take on the first three bosses in any order you wish, definitely something that's going to be key for Mythic Plus. The Underrot lies deep below the swamps of Nazmir and is probably one of the main causes of everything nasty going on in Nazmir, so obviously it's the first place we decide to look for shiny stuff. With the corruption leaking out from whatever lies below tainting the entire area, the dungeon looks quite creepy and messy, definitely a 180 from the golden temples of the trolls. Speaking of trolls, the blood trolls have a huge presence down here, so when you're not tackling corrupted plant life and weird maggots, Expect to see quite a few of our cannibalistic friends. The first boss is a Blood Troll Elder who will make good use of her crimson skills when trying to stop you from delving too deep into this secretive cavern. You'll move on to deal with an infected, overgrown Krog who has a bad case of indigestion. Poor thing just needs putting down. And after making your way past a few undead, you'll come across a large troll who has had one too many magic mushrooms. Definitely the bad kind of magic too. He'll try to blow you up with some crazy plagued shrooms, so be wary of his favourite treats, and then the source of the corruption awaits you at the end of the dungeon. It seems like these blood trolls have been experimenting quite a bit. On a completely different note, the Temple of Sithralis can be found in Voldoon. Not too surprising, as Voldoon is where you'll find all of the snake people slithering around. The temple is the burial place of an ancient snake lower, but the bad people are trying to do bad things, so we're going to put a stop to their plans and steal all of their trinkets at the same time. You'll be pitted against some overcharged Sethrak captains who love to use various lightning abilities to try and stop your progress, and a giant snake who seems to be nesting down here. Just be wary of the end. Eggs. Everyone knows eggs in an encounter room can only mean bad things. The powers of lightning that surge through these holes seem to have gone a bit crazy as well. As such, there's a few elementals roaming around who don't seem too pleased with anything, really. One of the bigger ones might give you a few troubles as you attempt to delve deeper into their sanctum. After an awesome party where all of the snake people are invited, you'll finally reach the avatar of Sithralis, who we need to save. The last boss here is a really fun heal the boss type of encounter, where we have to deal with a variety of ads while trying to save the life of the avatar. The temple is a really beautiful dungeon with quite a bit of variety in the enemies. As you level up a Horde character, you'll come to learn of the Motherlode. The Isle of Kazan might have looked to be in dire straits after the Cataclysm, but it seems like it's one heck of a hotspot for Azerite. That's something that everyone is going to be interested in, including the Venture Company. Sadly, they're selling off Azerite and Azerite-based weapons to the highest bidder, and we just can't have that. The entire dungeon is basically one huge goblin slum, filled with random mechanized golems and a whole bunch of refreshment vendors. You'll have to fight your 
your way past the coin-operated crowd pummeler, so if you have any spare coins handy, be sure to bring them along with you, or you could just kick a few football bombs, your choice. Due to the highly concentrated levels of Azerite, there's also a few Azerite beasties around that need to be slain and ground down into fine powder for use in our amulet, just be sure to ground down all of his elemental pals as well. And then you can move on to the goblins behind this mess. One is in charge of creating the weapons that utilize Azerite, so expect a few nasty experiments to be whipped out mid-battle to try and turn the tides, and then the other is the head honcho who reckons he can get away with selling off our precious Azerite. He thinks that goblin-inspired Mimron's head will save him, but he just doesn't seem to understand that Mecha Gnome sounds so much better than Mecha Goblin. He does seem to have a few rockets up his sleeve though, so be careful. It's not all about corruption and Azerite though, sometimes it's just about booty, and that's what we're sure to find in Freehold. Once a safe haven for pirates and scoundrels alike, a few changes in leadership seem to be bringing the cutthroats together under a single banner. That's probably not a good thing, so in we go to disrupt them as much as we can. You'll come face to face with the dreaded Sky Captain Crag and his trusty parrot mount Sharkbait. Be careful of the pirate, but always keep an eye on the sky. That's a big bird, and big birds mean big bird droppings. There's also a council of captains who currently lead the various crews scattered around Freehold. Taking them out is no easy feat, especially when they dump barrels on your head. Just remember that most pirates can be swindled with a little coin. Then we have the Ring of Booty. I told you there would be booty. In this pirate's fighting pit, anything goes, even using sharks as weapons. Just don't be surprised when he starts up his Sharknado. And then we have the fattest pirate I think I've ever seen. He's also a cheat. He comes well equipped with some loaded dice and just look at all that booty. That's a lot of gold. No wonder these pirates ended up following him. Freehold is a really fun adventure through an open air dungeon with seemingly a lot of different ways to approach each situation. I'm definitely looking forward to this one. While Kul Taras has a few problems with pirates, it also seems to have a problem keeping its own fleet under control. The Shrine of the Storm is where House Stormsong and the Tide Sages bestow blessings upon the fleet to ensure they stay afloat and come back in one piece. But something dark is stirring in the waters. Something familiar. Whatever it is, it's definitely a problem. As you work your way through this dungeon, you'll face off against all manner of water manipulation. The Tide Surges truly are masters of the sea, and they'll use that mastery to stop you in your tracks. Lord Stormsong even summons up a powerful sea elemental who has quite a few cool tricks, like splitting into multiple elementals and generally just being a pain in the rear. There's also another council fight with the Tide Sage Council. This council is made up of just two members, but they're both masters of warding magic, which means you'll be moving around quite a lot. They'll also try to blast you off their little platform, so don't wander too close to the edge. After trekking across an awesomely huge bridge, you can confront Lord Stormsong. Which isn't really what we fully expected. I guess you'll have to find out why by yourselves. The views in this dungeon are pretty fantastic, though. I'm super happy with the visuals that are being delivered so far. Perhaps one of my favourite dungeons so far is actually Waycrest Manor. A good chunk of the storyline in Drustvar deals with the disappearance of Lord and Lady Waycrest. So we finally arrive at their homestead to see exactly what's going on here. And it isn't good. This is basically a haunted house. If you ever played Luigi's Mansion, you should hopefully be prepared, but things are going to get spooky. Ghosts dropping in out of nowhere to try and assassinate you, creepy crawlies around every corner, and oh by the way, the doors don't always open. There's a specific route through the house each time you enter, so have fun getting lost. I know I did the first time. You'll have to fend off a trio of witches who pass around a special orb called the Focusing Iris. It's basically the old hags in Hercules, except when they get the orb they start doing crazy things like mind controlling your party. There's a giant spooky tree that comes to life in the courtyard outside who you'll need to try and burn down, as well as an oversized pigman who used to be a chef, but all he seems interested in eating right now is you. It definitely doesn't seem like the Lord and Lady Waycrest could be fine with all of this going on in their home. And it turns out they're not. They uncovered something that should have stayed buried, and I guess they're paying the price. I guess it's up to us to put the source of this evil back in the ground. As you level up on the Alliance side, the prison of Toldegore exchanges ownership. The Ashvane Company takes control. And we all know when a company takes control of a prison, it's probably not a good idea to oppose said company. You'll most likely end up in the prison they just bought. But hey ho, in we go anyways. Now, because we're not prisoners, but we want to get into the prison, we're going to have to be a little sneakier about this. I heard the sewers are always a great entry point. It always seems to work in all the movies. 
and all of the raids. Sadly, there's a bit of a beastie roaming just outside in the sands who'll have to take care of first, but a Sand Queen won't stop the forces of the Horde or the Alliance from locking themselves up. After the sewers, you get to work your way through the various floors of this prison, taking on prisoners, gang members, and all manner of unsavoury folk before you come upon their leaders. The first is a wargan with a bad attitude who doesn't like to fight fair. If you land a few too many punches, he'll start letting out more prisoners, so you have to fight off a wolfman and a prison riot. The second leader you come upon is quite simply a pyromaniac with a love of bombs. If you're not quick on your feet, she'll blow them right off. As you head into the upper levels, you also get to take control of some of the prison's defences. There's a few cannons which are locked and loaded, ready to let you blow your friends off the side of the walls. Seriously though, be careful, that stuff hurts. Up at the tippy top, you'll find a bloke who loves Azerite so much that every bullet loaded into his guns are dripping with the stuff. That makes for some unpredictable results, so you're going to have to think quickly and watch the cannons too. There's also two mythic-only dungeons in Battle for Azeroth, King's Rest and Siege of Boralus. King's Rest actually lies behind the Taldazar, it's the true tomb of the Troll Kings. You can venture deep into their ancient burial site to see just what's so special about these long dead monarchs. It's definitely going to be a dungeon you're going to want to explore. The Siege of Boralus, on the other hand, is something a little newer. Boralus is the Alliance hub city, so this probably makes you question why it's a dungeon and why it's being sieged. Well, you're going to have to explore these two dungeons for yourselves, but believe me when I say they're both amazing experiences. And that's it for the dungeons in Battle for Azeroth. I wanted to give you a little sneak peek without spoiling the entire setup or storyline through each dungeon, and while I really wanted to spill my guts about the two mythic-only dungeons, I think it's going to be a wonderful experience to hop in there by yourselves and just take it all in. I guess you'll probably end up getting spoiled somewhere down the line, but I honestly can't wait to explore these dungeons all over again when BFA goes live. What do you think from what you've seen of the dungeons so far? Does any particular dungeon stick out as really interesting or really cool? Leave all your thoughts in the comments section below. A big thank you to all of our supporters over on Patreon. If you want to hop on that train, you can find a link in the description below. Remember to leave a like just below the video before you leave. If you want to see more, make sure to subscribe. But apart from that, thanks for watching, folks. Good luck and have fun, and as always, I will see you next time.